coming to the right. He's up there. He's about 100 out right now. This week on Kentucky Field, turkey season is nearly here. So the first thing that we're going to do is take a look at a great spring hunt from 2019. Next, turkey season and ticks go hand in hand. We're talking to a few tick experts to find out what's true, what's not, and how to prepare before hitting the woods. Then, what is that? Oh, we caught him a saw guy. Do you like to catch fish? Well, if so, then you'll love the white bass run. It's all next on Kentucky Field. Such a pretty fish. Beautiful. This pond is plum floated with frogs. They're everywhere in here. <laughs> Yeah, this is a good fish right here. Really good fish. Come here, girl. Hey, boy. That's a big rabbit. Nice job. Yes! Yes! <laughs> My first musket. <laughs> Mercy Leo! Yeah, look here, he's getting to be Here it goes! Oh, Boom! Oh, oh, oh. Wow, that happened fast. Hello, and welcome to Kentucky Field. I'm your host, Chad Miles. Join us as we journey the Commonwealth in search of outdoor adventure. Hey, turkey season starts up next weekend, and now's the time to start getting excited. We just got the decoys set out, and we're in a location where any turkey that comes into this field should be able to see this decoy. We have not heard a gobble yet this morning but we know there are turkeys here. This is about the time of day they normally start separating out again, and that gives you the best chance of calling one in. We got a turkey straight across the field, probably 150 yards. Here comes another one. We got two turkeys. These look like Jake's. They're coming straight out in the field right here. Here comes another one. A third turkey just came into the field. I think we've got three Jake's. We've got one on the left and we've got two on the right. They're making their way across this field. I know they're gonna come over here. Here comes another turkey. Looks to me like we've got three jakes in a hand. Here they come, right here, coming right at us. I've got two jakes in range right now. Let's let this play out and see what happens. They're curious. Jake's decided to pass. That's awesome. That's why you come out. The close encounters are super, super exciting. There's a coyote all the way in the far corner. Coming out there in the field right there. Watching wildlife's always fun. But when you're on a turkey hunt and a coyote shows up, it's not necessarily a good thing. That coyote just caught something, a mouse or something. So we hunted here this morning and we saw some jakes and never heard a gobble. 
we had a game plan set for this afternoon hunt. It was walking in. And before I enter any field, I'll make sure I scan it as good as I can. Up there in the corner, through a tree, I see a black dot, and we start looking at it, and it goes into full strut. We got our decoy set up, backed off. We're gonna try to call this turkey in. It's probably about 250 yards right now. this gobbler to sound off. First gobble we've heard yet. Hopefully we can get it to come to us. Problem is, a hand has popped out on the other side of the field. So we got a little competition from the real thing. We gotta hope our decoy and our calling sounds a little better than that hand right there. This was, this was the craziest hunt. It took more patience than maybe any turkey hunt I've been on. Let's go see what we got. There he is. Oh my God. I tell you what, beautiful bird. Got a big thick beard on it. Some pretty impressive hooks on it too. Such an awesome hunt. Really, really excited to be able to get this bird because this was a solid three hours of watching this bird work. And lo and behold, he wasn't coming through this field. This bird decided it was gonna come in and sneak in and get a better look at that Jake decoy through the woods. And that's exactly what he did. Here today with tournament kayak angler, Christine Fisher, how you doing? I'm doing good, Chad. I'll tell you, one of the things that I am most interested in is how people can organize all their gear into a kayak and be out there pretty much self-sufficient for the day. Let's start with the most important tool for an angler, your rod. Yeah. So my boat, the Hobie Pro Angler 14, has horizontal rod storage, and that keeps the rods out of the way. Uh, you don't get them caught in anything. Is this pretty common that most of them have rod storage on the sides? It's not. There, there are only a few fishing models out there that, mm -hmm. that have that horizontal rod storage. What would you do if you didn't have those particular compartments? How would you store your rods? A lot of kayakers, um, we need a way to transport our gear and we'll have some sort of a, this is essentially a glorified milk crate. Yeah. As you can see, a lot of kayakers will mount rod holders on the back of them Okay. Um, with zip ties. Mine comes built in with a couple of rod storage okay. here. So I, I like having them behind me. So any boat that you have, you can find something that works for you. Okay. Where do you keep your tackle in here? couple different places. So um, as you can see, this is this is my terminal tackle go to back mm -hmm, here. So mm -hmm. all my hard baits, top water, spring baits, um, all terminal stuff goes here. My plastic situation, like I said, right now I'm pretty light, but under the seat, you see there's a lot of clearance oh, there. Yeah, yeah. All of my soft plastics, like tubes, uh, Senko, stick baits, big worms, finesse baits, 
I have a designated plastic tub for that. Mm. And I can fit two of those, one here and one here under my seat. Usually when I'm fishing, I have a good idea of what plastics I'm gonna be using the most of. Mm -hmm. And a lot of, most kayaks on the market have some sort of a- That's your day box. Yeah, like a square hatch there. Yeah. And so baits that I'm using the most of, I'm putting right there so it's right in front of me. I'm not digging for them and they're easily accessible. Where do you keep your net and do you net it left-handed? How do you, how do you go about doing that? Well, I reel left-handed, Okay. so if you think about that, um, my net always sits right here on my front hatch, and I okay. kind of almost set it underneath my A-trail here. Okay. That way, when I'm fishing, my rod's always in my right hand, because I reel with my left on everything. Okay. Um, I'm able to, once I get the fish to the boat, I'm able to just very quickly reach right here, and it, most of my fish are landing on this side of my kayak. This is just growing like crazy, and it's going to keep growing because one, it's so much fun. It's easy to get into. And if, it don't matter where you live in the state of Kentucky, you can find a place to be on the water fishing in a kayak, probably within three, four miles of your house. Absolutely, yeah. We had a very mild winter this year in Kentucky. That could mean more ticks. Here's what you need to know before hitting the field. We're outside today with Jonathan Larson with the University of Kentucky Entomology Department. And you guys do a ton of research. Yeah, we got a lot of bugs here in Kentucky. Some of them are good, some of them are bad. Most of them are kind of indifferent, but we got to understand that. We got to understand their biology and we got to understand how we interact with them. So you guys have got an entire program that study their impact on nature and landscape is also their impact on people. Yeah, we have a lot of basic research that goes on in the department. People trying to understand the insects themselves, looking at the way they smell, looking at the way they survive being frozen over the winter. We have some people working on protecting pollinators like bees and monarchs. We have others that do stuff like I do, which is look at crop pests or ornamental pests. And we have a lot of folks that are focusing in on that human health aspect. One of the human health aspects is ticks. Yes. Ticks in Kentucky have a real interesting history. So we're trying to figure out just where they are, what all the species are. We have a real good handle on who lives here, but not exactly every county that they live in. And so we want to be able to teach people what risks they may be encountering if they're going outside in a certain place. And we definitely want to help them keep themselves safe. And we're going to talk to one of these individuals that are studying ticks right here in the state of Kentucky. That's right. So what kept you interested in studying ticks? Originally, I was interested in any kind of vector disease. So okay. ticks are big vectors for public health diseases. And I had an opportunity to work with Kentucky Department of Public Health on their tick surveillance. And I took it, and I, I love it. It's a lot of fun. So for people that spend a lot of time outdoors, our turkey season is right around the corner here in the state of Kentucky. Mm -hmm. And in April, ticks are starting to come out. Tell me a little bit about what times of the year and types of areas that ticks are most prevalent. So ticks are active in really humid areas. As it gets closer to the summer, it gets a little hotter outside, they'll become more active. And you'll find them in areas of like forest and field habitat. So areas where you're gonna hunt for, like you said, turkey or any other animals. They like to stay pretty hidden. So in grassy fields or they'll hide on the edges of branches like this and wait for a host to come by and grab onto you. <laughs> <laughs> so they can be hard to see on, on you, yeah. and sometimes really small, but especially if you're wearing camo, they can really hide on there. Yes. So tell me what you would do, if you're gonna go out turkey hunting, hiking, what you would do to prevent becoming a host for a tick. So the first thing that you wanna do is provide some kind of insecticide. Permethrin is the best. You just apply it to your clothes and then it can work for several days after application. That way you don't have to put it on your skin. They get onto the permethrin and crawl around for a little bit, they die off. What would you recommend as far as a chemical that people would apply to themselves to keep ticks off of them? DEET is a good one to use. Most insecticide repellents that you can buy at the store will have a list of the insects that they repel. Mm -hmm. And any of the ones that say ticks are probably a good choice. DEET can come from levels from 10% to nearly 100%. Yeah. Tucking your pants into your socks, wearing high socks and boots is really effective. You really just want to think about what is the best way that I can cover myself so that the ticks cannot reach my skin. Okay. So duct taping your socks around your ankles, tucking your shirt into your pants, wearing a bandana around your neck. Those are things that are going to provide a barrier between the ticks and you. I know that when you are out in any kind of habitat where ticks may be, it's always a good idea to do tick checks mm -hmm. every once in a while. How much does re removing the tick 
pretty quickly help and avoid any type of tick-borne illnesses. It's extremely important. Mm -hmm. Now once that tick attaches to you, if it's carrying that bacteria, it needs about 36 hours before you become infected. Okay. So if you can remove the tick as soon as you see it, that is essential. So when you do get a tick on you, you found one that's been embedded. There's a million ways that people have talked about removing ticks. Yes. Tell me what you recommend. So there's one safe way to remove a tick. When it embeds into you, you want to take a pair of tweezers, get as close to the skin as you can, pull on the tick straight up until it lets go. People will say, twist the tick. Um, that can cause the mouth parts to break off. And while the most of the body of the tick will come off, those mouth parts will still be embedded in okay. your skin. Some people have some allergies to ticks. What type of allergies would you have to be concerned with? One of the big allergies is red meat allergy. Okay. Um, this is something that's usually picked up from the Lone Star Tick. The Lone Star Tick in the saliva has a sugar molecule called alpha-gal. So I'm here today with Dr. Turbyville, and I was recently speaking to some entomologists at UK, and they were telling me about some allergies from ticks. It's called what? Galactose Alpha-1-3 Galactose is the whole name, but it's okay. uh, most people shorten it as Alpha-Gal. People have been talking about it now for a couple years here in the state of Kentucky, but it's been around for quite some time. It was first reported around 2008, but it's probably been around longer because we know there were case reports as far back as 1989 where patients had reactions to meat that we look back and say that was probably Alpha-Gal. It resides in pretty much hooved animals, is that right? Alpha-gal is a sugar. Most allergies are proteins, so like if you're allergic to peanuts or shellfish, it's a protein that you're reacting to. You react almost immediately when you eat it, whereas with alpha-gal, it's a delayed reaction. So it's like two to six hours after you eat the meat, and it's only mammalian meat, so mostly beef and pork, but it can be in deer, it can be in any mammal, basically. Okay. I would say compared to allergies like peanut and shellfish, it tends to be more mild reactions that we see. Usually hives is the most common thing, but there's a subset of patients that just gets abdominal pain and distress and they'll have that again, usually delayed a couple hours after they eat. And I've seen a few patients who just had swelling, like lip swelling, and they didn't have the hives with it. But most people will have hives and itching. Is this a lifelong diagnosis? So for most, it is not. The Lone Star Tick is the primary vector that passes it. So they'll get bit by the tick, and then their levels of alpha-gal will go up. And then over time, as long as they don't keep getting bit by the tick, it'll fall usually to a level where they can tolerate meat again. But then if they get bit again and resensitize, that level can go up higher. So there's no guarantee that it can't come back even if it's gone away. If you were to have someone come in, and would, you would not tell them to avoid their passion and activities of being outdoors, right? No, absolutely not. You need to take reasonable precautions. Try to avoid getting the ticks on you. Check yourself for ticks, but I would not discourage people from going out in the woods and doing what they enjoy doing. I think it also underscores the importance of what you guys do at Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife because we know that the tick population mirrors the deer population. For that reason, I would tell people don't stop hunting. You know, we need to do what we can to help control the population. Maybe the best bank fishing opportunity we have here in the state of Kentucky is the spring white bass run. The white bass are running. Let's walk down into the Salt River and see if anyone's having any luck. You got a black crappie on there, some white bass. Where are you from? Marchburg. Marchburg. What's your name? James Whitehouse. James Whitehouse. So I'll tell you what, there's nothing like getting down here in the spring and just walking the banks. Because it is the best time of year to get out and fish. You're throwing a little pink Popeye, and that's how you're it's catching them. Oh, last two days, I don't think I've hit. It's really amazing, because people have their techniques and the way they like to catch them, but you're catching them up. You're probably dr drifting about two feet below or three feet, something like that. So have you seen quite a few other people through here fishing lately? Well, the, the yesterday, a bunch of people. One guy stood right there, the pink Popeye, he called about they were third or four cash. So how many years you've been coming down here and fishing? Ever since you've been in here. So you, you're originally from Lawrenceburg? Yeah. No, I'm from Boyle County. So now Boyle County, the Dix River also yeah. has white yeah, bass. I caught them up there too. Okay. So you've traveled the state catching these, yeah. these early, early I fish. I caught the world these times. <laughs> <laughs> well, I really do appreciate your time. Thank you and good luck. That's a heck of a stringer you got. Saw guy. That guy's been telling us he wanted to catch one. He just figured it out. Here we go. Little male. Now I'll tell you, I made about 10 casts right here. I was letting it bounce the bottom and every now and then getting hung up, so I decided to 
feed the retrieve up. Now these fish, when they're ready to feed, can be really aggressive. We'll see if that holds true. I'll cast out a little further and burn it a little faster back in. Here we go. I'll tell you right now, these fish are wanting this bait aggressive. And if I can get it out there, it's really, really hard because you know we're fishing early, early, early year conditions. But we gotta understand these are fish that like the cold weather. They really want this bait fast today. What is that? Oh, he caught him a saw guy. Look at that. You know, you never know what you're gonna catch come out here. See a guy with a stringer full of crappie. We've seen a guy with a stringer full of white bass. And now look at that, saw guy. Those are good ones too. You can't beat that. Oh, man. I'm happy. Oh, here we go. This, this might be a little better one here. Now, I don't know what we've got, but this is not a white bass. Whatever we've got is not happy to be hooked. This is a white bass. Now, now. At first glance, I thought this was a white bass, but this is actually a hybrid. These fish are all moving up here kind of at the same time. Boy, that's a lot of fun. Taylor's Lake has a bunch of hybrids and they were put in here by the department many years ago to deal with the amount of bait uh, the fish that are in this in this lake. And uh, this is a bait fish eating machine right here. I have got me a little honey hole all of a sudden. It's all about finding the pace and the speed that they want it. This is the third or fourth one I've caught this size. And what this is, this is a male white bass. White bass, like a lot of other fish species, what they'll do is the males will show up first. So these males will run up this river stream and when you start catching the smaller ones, typically you either need to go toward the main lake, try to catch the females, or fish that same spot in a few days after a hard rain, the bigger fish will show up. This is, uh, this is definitely a male white bass. This is the greatest thing about fishing in this river. You've got so much walk-in access. There's a boat ramp, you can run a boat right up in here. Or this might be the easiest and best way right here. You just jump in a kayak. They can t pull that thing up anywhere on the bank that they want and catch a fish. It's a great way to go about it. You guys had any luck? Uh, I caught a little flathead earlier, but oh, really? we literally just got in. We ain't been on the water maybe 10 minutes. A flathead? Yeah. Wow. Off the crank or off the dirt bank. Never know. Oh, here we go. Uh-oh, might have another hybrid. These species of fish fight like crazy. Now this is a white bass. Hey, you're getting a little bit bigger. And when you get out here and you fish this, sometimes, you know, people will swear on a certain color. And for me, you know, sometimes it does seem like certain colors may work better on certain days. I always tend to like white or this pearl color, and then I'll change up the head color. And for whatever reason, it seems like pink is what they're hitting today. There you go, he's got one down there. There we go. Same size fish. These are plenty big enough to clean and eat if you wanted to make a mess. To get that cast out there, you really need a rod and reel that will allow you to make long casts. This is a medium action with an extra fast tip, seven foot, four inches. And I sometimes even use a longer one. I'm throwing four to six pound test. I can't remember what's on there, but you really want to be able to rip real long cast. This bait here is only an eighth ounce. So making a cast right and get to the middle is really the most important part of this, is getting the, getting the bait out there where the fish are at. Now let's check in and see who else has been out having fun in this week's Ones That Didn't Get Away. Hey, Easton and Ellie Hughes know how to spend summer break, and that is fishing for spotted trout. They caught these in North Carolina. Congratulations. 
Here we have Emma Thompson with her very first bass ever. She caught in a family farm pond in Marion County. Nice job. Here we have 19 year old Megan McRae with her very first deer ever. A nice eight point buck taken in Mercer County. Congratulations. Here we have a nice nine point buck taken by Thomas Riggs of Upton, Kentucky. Nice job. Here we have a nice six point buck taken by Ronald Crick of McLean County. Nice job. Here we have Ashley Riggs with her very first deer ever, a nice spiked buck taken in Upton, Kentucky. Nice job. Hey, just a reminder that turkey season starts next weekend. Try to introduce someone new to the outdoors. And remember, hunting and fishing on private property is a privilege. Always ask permission and thank the landowner. Until next week, I'm your host, Chad Miles. I hope to see you in the woods or on the water.